Hello, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm talking about unseen past. Now, the first thing I want to say is when I was asked about being a presenter as part of this session, the first thing that came to mind is, I can't do this. I've already got too much going on. I'm too busy. But then once I heard about the theme as disruptions and deviations, there were so many connections with my life that I said, yes, this is something I really need to do. So what we're going to talk about, generally speaking, is this idea of, is the obvious path your path? Is it the best path that you could possibly be on? And in telling my story about going from path to path to path to where I think is the perfect place for me to be, I want you to also not think of it as just my story, but as potentially your story, and the framework in which I present it as also applying to you, either now or at some other time. So as mentioned in the introduction, if you go back to the 1970s, my very first job was working on a garbage truck. And I actually loved that job. I sort of adopted the man who owned the truck and the business as being my grandfather, because all of my biological grandparents had died before I was born. And so those years are really powerful years when I got to enjoy his wisdom. On the right at the top there, uh, when I did construction work with my father's um, construction business, and my father ran the equipment, which was his equipment, and my tool of choice was actually the shovel. So for most of my 20s, uh, my expertise was in yielding a shovel. As you go on into the end of the 70s and, and into the early 80s, I actually became very interested in computers and electronics. And through some adult ed courses and taking some vocational courses, actually taught myself computer programming and developed some expertise in electronics. And I was actually hired by IBM. Um, and I made that move to IBM at an amazing time. The manufacturing branch of IBM was growing as there was increasing demand for computers, specifically mainframe computers at that time. I was at IBM when the first desktop computers came out, when nobody knew how to use them. I remember boxes of desktop computers stacked up in offices not being open because nobody had a clue exactly what they were supposed to do with them. But it was an amazing time to be a part of a Fortune 500 computer company. IBM prided itself on having gone through the, the depression and never laying off an employee. So IBM had a full employment policy. So the corporate culture was, if you did your job, met expectations, stayed out of trouble, you would have a job for life. So what better place to possibly be? Um, I received constant praise through high evaluations, regular raises. I was making an amazing amount of money for the 80s. And if that isn't the definition of success in America, I don't know what, else, what is or so what else could there possibly be? Well, let's bring into this, for those of you that were here for the last session, you heard a little bit about Joseph Campbell, but I'm gonna use him to frame my journey in a different way. I learned about Joseph Campbell from a series of interviews that he did with Bill Moyers called Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth. And Joseph Campbell wrote and lectured a lot about commonalities between myth and religion. And I was raised to be very religious. And this made a lot of sense to me because it n didn't necessarily make it all Bible-based, but it was things that I could really cling to and understand and which actually framed my entire experience going forward. So one of his quotes, and there's many in this talk, people say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think that what we're seeking is an experience of being alive, and that what we want to feel is the rapture of being alive. And this resonates with me because I can remember times when I was doing very well, but there was something missing even though I didn't have a clue. In putting this talk together, I tried to remember what happened in my life in 1992. An entire year passed, I can't remember a single thing that happened in 1992. But when things sort of changed, I certainly remember much about what happened after that. One of Joseph Campbell's sayings is that you're going to see over and over is this can be summarized by follow your bliss. Find what gives you inner joy and go toward it. I actually became so attracted to this as I was also struggling with some personal things in the very late 80s and early 90s that I actually had to put a banner up like this um, on a wall at my home. Well. As you get into the early 
90s, everything started to change. There was a recession going on in the early 90s, and at IBM, IBM's products and services, particularly in the mainframe area, were under a lot of pressure. Sales were declining, and the manufacturing division was actually losing a lot of money. And it became obvious, painfully obvious, that IBM was going to have to give up its full employment plan or culture, and things were going to change. And so actually, those of us that were in the manufacturing workforce were the targets. So the two things you really didn't want to be at that time, if you worked at IBM, was first of all in manufacturing. And second of all, you didn't want to be 40 years or older, because we were the prime targets. Because number one, we'd achieved relatively high salaries due to regular merit increases. As I said, I constantly got good evaluations and raises. And the other thing is we were on the verge of becoming a permanent part of the IBM pension plan, which means there are also future debt concerns. So if you fit in that category, you were ground zero. So there I was, 40 years old, the corporate business, the business model changing, about to face no job. I had no college degree. I was basically self-taught. I had internal certificates with IBM where I had taken courses and achieved certain skills, but that really wasn't going to have a lot of marketability outside. And because I had worked for a company that never laid anybody off, I had no plans for what I would do next because it didn't seem like it would ever be necessary. But does that mean there was no hope? Well, April 1st, 1993 was the day. And my list of things to do for that day was very, very predictable. I knew it was going to go this way. I would drive to work. I left a comedy tape in the cassette player of my truck to be there to sort of soothe me when I left. I knew that once I got there, I would just wait to get called into my boss's office, at which time I would sign my exit papers and turn in my badge. And then I would drive home. And then what would I do? I would go back to bed. And actually, all of this took about two hours to do. So two hours after I got up and left for work, I was back home, unemployed, going back to bed, because what else was there to do? But it wasn't just what happened to me. And what made it you know, such a deep thing was that 4,000 people at East Fishco Plant, where I worked, were laid off that day as the company went from 9,000 to less than 5,000 employees in one day. In the Hudson Valley area, 10,000 employees were laid off on that same day. So it wasn't just like you said, well, okay, my department is downsizing. I'm going to go over there and apply for a job. You got the sense that your skills were just, they were just like you were a fossil. There was nothing that you were going to be able to do in terms of staying on the same path you had been on. Now, Joseph Campbell puts a spin on this that says, we must learn to let go of the path we planned so that we can have the life that is waiting for us. So that's a whole new concept because most of us think, I certainly did, that if I don't make every decision and if I don't follow sort of the straight and narrow, then what else is there? And so when I made this slide and I put in this picture of this red balloon, you can think of it in two ways. There's letting go of the balloon as though the balloon is your identity, your corporate identity, your job identity, your paycheck, your benefits. But you can also think of like that and think of, I am the balloon. I'm what's being let go. And that balloon is going to go somewhere. And some forces are going to take it someplace, but it's largely beyond its control. But it has no choice but to go. Finding a different path. If you can see the path laid out in front of you, step by step, you know it's not your path. Your own path you make with every step you take, and that's why it's your path. And what was so new about this is rather than being on a path where I would know what promotion I was eligible for in another year, a year and a half, now everything was based on what I chose to do. And if you think about it, when we go through change, there's always that point of contact. So right there where it says you are here. When that ball hits the floor and rebounds, that's a painful moment. It's twisted, it's contorted by the forces around it, which it has no control over, and yet that's unavoidable for it to be able to launch itself on the next trajectory. But I had been taught, primarily by my mother, that good people bounce. And what does that mean? That means that good people, people who believe in themselves, overcome hard times. 
Hard times are not an anomaly in life. I believe hard times are there. It's a part of life, just like losing loved ones is a part of life. But one shouldn't and doesn't let trouble define you. Just because something has happened to you doesn't mean you internalize that and say, that's me. No, that's today. Let's see what tomorrow is. And the other thing that I had to realize is that change is always scary. And it can seem like what's scary about change is the future, but no, what's scary about change as I see it is that moment of contact, that you are here moment, when you just don't know what's coming. It's not so much that you think the future is going to be worse, it's more you just, we just don't like change. Human beings are very predictable in that way. Moving forward, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. So what was I going to do? I did think of one course of action. And that course was that I was already involved in a work study program at IBM. And I was taking college courses. And so I wondered if there would be any way that I could actually continue and finish the semester. I'd been laid off at mid-semester of a one-year program. It was very difficult for me to actually call my second level manager, Ed Scott, and ask, could I please finish the, the semester? And he was very surprised at the request. I think when he heard me on the phone, he expected me to either curse him out or plead to be rehired. And all I wanted to do was finish the semester. Well, the complication was the classes were taught at an IBM site. So they would have to reissue me a temporary badge, and they would have to hope that my presence, surrounded by IBM employees who hadn't gotten laid off, would actually not cause a disturbance. After consulting with corporate office, I was told, yes, I could finish it. And it was very important there that I did not yield to the anger of feeling jilted. Other students who I said, hey, they're going to let us go back and finish the semester, even though we got laid off, were like, are you crazy? I don't want anything to do with IBM for the rest of my life. And so it was important then not to let anger interfere with something that made sense to do. If you follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. Follow your bliss and don't be afraid. The hardest thing is when you get to that moment to not be afraid. And that fear will generate anger and prevent you from being able to see possibilities. So what was the new path? Sometimes the only thing you can do is put one foot in front of the other and move forward, even though you don't have a clue where you're going. Completing those classes in that semester that I asked could I finish while I was, that were taught IBM work study, actually allowed me to complete a two-year associate's degree um, at Dutchess Community College within one more year. And totally unbeknownst to me, by doing that, I ended up getting tuition reimbursement as part of my severage package, something I wasn't even aware of. And also, under the North American Free Trade Act, so an employee at the New York State Department of Unemployment contacted me and said, have you been taking classes since you got laid off? And because I had asked and because I had finished those work study courses, the answer was yes. And so I received extended unemployment benefits and actually was on unemployment for almost all of my time through college. At one point, they sent me a check for $8,700 in back unemployment benefits while I was a full-time student. And who knew? I didn't know about any of these things. These were things that other people informed me about that I otherwise would not know that I either could or should take advantage of. Follow your bliss, and the universe will open doors for you where there were only walls. So what kinds of doors? I got another unsolicited letter inviting me to apply for this program called Exploring Transfer at Vassar College. And as you might guess, not only was I accepted into that program, I ended up going to Vassar College. I started full-time at Vassar when I was 41 years old. That led to doing internships. I did internships at Stanford University, NASA, and Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. And 10 years later, almost to the day, near the end of March in 2003, I defended my dissertation and was awarded my doctorate in brain and cognitive science from the University of Rochester. And all of those things were absolutely impossible on that day in, of April 1993 when I walked out of IBM. What gives life meaning? Life has no meaning. Each of us has meaning. And we bring that meaning to life. And so, to me, 
this idea that don't ask the question, what does life mean? Bring meaning to life. You are the meaning. And to me, the real value in life is the quality of the people you know and love and those who love you. And there are literally, I, can, I could rattle off name after name after name of people that I have met along this path that I never would have got it, gotten to know otherwise. And every single one of them was worth that disruption and that deviation away from that path onto this path. Be, the, be your ideal self. The privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. And but that may not be available at the end of the obvious path or certainly the easiest path. 20 years plus, I am so thankful that I lost my job at IBM because I would not have, and you certainly probably would not have the courage to walk away from a high paying corporate job to go out and do what life really intended you to do. And uncertainty is, an un, is a necessary part of discovering unseen paths. Once again, it's very hard for us to look out and not see opportunity, but yet really believe it's out there, although I believe it is for all of us. And finally, I am, and I hope you will eventually also one day, be who and where you were always meant to be. Thank you.